Can you um, yeah, see everything that, properly? We, we can see your second slide, I think. There's a, there's 10 of us here. So a wide range of, of attendees. But um, we've started recording. So whenever you're ready, Jeff. We can't hear you anymore for some reason. Okay, thank you all again. Um, uh, since it's for the recording, I'll say it again. Uh, Jeffrey Dombacher, I've been invited here by Scott Pearson, and it's always lovely to be with Scott. And now I get to meet his students and fellow faculty at the University of Liverpool. So I was asked to drop in and uh, give a, a little introduction to some of the applications I've been developing with qualitative mathematical modeling. And so I'll just give you an overview of some of the techniques and how I apply them in my work, some of which goes into the area of risk, which I know is a passion for Scott and a lot of people probably here online. So I'll just start with a very general introduction about how I see the sort of science and uh, management interface going on in my work um, around Australia and the world. And that a lot of people are like to have those nature papers or science papers and they, they like to have um, really big publications in what they call cutting edge science. And cutting edge science can be typified, you know, with, with probably a lot of sins in my general description as something that involves relatively few processes, relatively fewer interactions between processes, uh, smaller spatial and temporal scales, and a smaller contraction of number of disciplines. Um, I would make the, the point that greater portion of advances in this area are uh, amenable to narrowly focused problems, a narrowly focused approach. Complex problems, however, require critical questions emerging not at a narrow edge of a single discipline, but rather along the broad intersection of many. And here we have what I call joining edge science. Here our collective endeavor becomes uh, to pull together the knowledge that helps us understand multiple processes with multiple interactions across larger temporal and spatial scales and multidisciplinary approach. Now, multidisciplinary approaches, oh, can we get rid of that bar? Because they can't see the tops of all these slides. I wonder what the... I think I'm going to minimum. Hide floating pen. Hide meeting control check. Um, so yeah, challenges to interdisciplinary research are well known, um, lots of papers on them and they all kind of converge upon these, what I can put into these three dot points. Institutional barriers and silos, these never really go away, they just re-emerge, they follow the money, especially at CSIRO, they reorganize all the time, uh, but no matter where, how the money gets spent, that's where the, the silos sit, usually around to uh, um, control the flow of funds, but but basically institutions do can overcome this. So I, I think that we can we can say that there's a, a progress there. Also sustaining collaborations between research groups and individuals that also could we've gotten better at that I believe collectively around the world. Um, and now my mouse doesn't work again. So yes, tick on that, tick on that. Uh, but effective communication. Well, I'm not so sure here. Um, here, I think we find a fixation on jargon and semantics when we're looking at it, uh, discourse between disciplines. Uh, this is based upon the worldviews of the participants with their own inherent structures of the, from their objects of interest. And these objects of, of interest have their own temporal and spatial scales and organizational structures built around them. This requires a conceptual synthesis that makes clear which components and processes are relevant to the problem at hand, and more importantly, which are not. What, what can we leave out of the model? Um, and to typify this conversation between the disciplines, we have um, my favorite comic from XKCD, where we have the, uh, the poor sociologists on the left of the scale of purity of science, uh, and they're looked down upon sometimes by psychologists, which say that psychology is just applied uh, sociology is just applied psychology, and the biologists 
uh, that say that psychology is just applied biology, which gets handed off to the chemist, showing that it's just applied chemistry. And fine, at least in terms of their point of view, uh, it's just applied physics. It's nice to be on the top. But way over on the right side, we find this wonderful woman mathematician saying, hey, I didn't see you guys all the way over there. But uh, jokes aside, I think it's the job of the mathematicians, those that are really gifted at uh, uh, abstraction and, and looking at, at, at things from a, a pure sort of way, mathematical way, can help the discourse between these other disciplines. And that's the, the role of mathematics. Um, and when you two approaches of complexity, there's not only the science of it, there's the art. Uh, making the simple complicated is common, but making the complicated simple, awesome and simple, now that's creativity. And I think that should be within our modern framework is how to parsimoniously represent the uh, reality of the world um, that, it, you know, for lack of a better word, can approach beauty and creativity. You can, I think you can get to it. But uh, a more hard-headed approach might be to say that the role of mathematics is to educate the intuition to make the obscure obvious. So our abstractions need to encompass the problem in a way that it can reveal the paradoxes and the conflicts and the contradictions. So you, if you have too narrowly a focus of problem, you might leave those contradictions outside of your model. So Richard Levins in the 60s developed a strategy of model building and population biology, which I've tried to apply in my work in Australia for the last 20 years. And I've made some progress. Um, and his, the stated goals for, from his perspective was that first and foremost, we, we make an abs a mathematical abstraction so that we can under better understand the world and make predictions and to craft interventions because it's not only necessary that we understand the world, but we want to change it as well. So he said that in any one abstraction or modeling um, activity, there are three attributes which we covet. We would love to have realism so that parameters and variables in the model uh, represent those attributes that we see in the real world. Um, we would like our models to have precision so that when a manager asks, how much more do I need to spend on, on X to, to get this amount of Y? Um, and generality, we would like our models to be transportable in context, perhaps, or space or time, or if um, uh, things, conditions change a little. We hate to have to go back and reparameterize everything since uh, uh, when there's a small change or uh, a, a change in venue, so to speak. Uh, the trouble is, if you try to maximize all three of these attributes in any one modeling exercise, we have a model that becomes unwieldy and uh, not fit for purpose. It, um, in fact, uh, the, the amount of computational power that we've developed since the 60s uh, has not assuaged this problem to, at all. Uh, we have models that, that bury us in numbers, so to speak, and that we have to do subsampling of the results just to understand the output. Are we any better off then? Uh, we have a model that's as complicated to understand as the world is representing. So Richard Levin says that we, we um, knowingly or unknowingly, we make trade-offs. So that if you were to give up realism and embrace generality and precision, not totally, but in terms of maximization, you have what we could call uh, statistical models. Um, here we have precise correlations, but we lack causation. Hey, who's doing that? This must be a pre-recorded thing that's <laughs> coming back into it. Pretty cool. Um, I didn't do that. And then over here, we have uh, uh, mechanistic models. <laughs> Maybe AI is pretty good after yeah. that, yeah. <laughs> uh, numerical simulation or mechanistic models. Um, if you give up generality and embrace realism and precision, you have models that reflect in excruciating detail how we think the world works. If we can apply first principles of physics or, or whatever it is that we can dump into some equations and parameterize. Both of these approaches, statistical and mechanistic, are data hungry, lots of parameters to fill the parameter space, and uh, they take time and money to build, um, and, and they get the benefit of the precision. Um, unfortunately, the mechanistic models are not transportable. A small change in parameter or condition might mean that you have to recalibrate a large area of your uh, parameter space. So they can be expensive to, 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 to apply to a new situation. 
uh, if you do the heretical act of not maximizing precision, but instead embrace reality or realism and generality, then you have what Richard Levins calls a qualitative modeling approach. And here we can uh, represent processes and functions in a, in a qualitative way. But what is, it, is the curve convex upwards or downwards? Uh, uh, is the slope positive or negative with respect to uh, interaction between species? And draw general conclusions that can um, encompass the reality of the world, but with lacking precision. Island biogeography theory is a perfect example of, of a qualitative approach. Uh, the, the intersecting lines get us a, 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 this idea of a, of a, a, a equilibrium number of species, and uh, that theoretical framework has been very powerful, I think, in ecology as a, as a way to guide our, our understanding of those, those issues. So all of these modeling approaches have their values, uh, but all have their drawbacks, and on, they're each leaving out something about the world on purpose. In a way, they're telling a little lies. So, and they're simplifying abstractions of the world, simplifying assumptions of the world. Um, they each have a different way of approaching the same problem. And Levin said that if we wish to have a robust understanding, a robust theorem about how the world works, we need to have different models with different simplifying assumptions converging upon the same answer. And that's probably our best uh, approximation of what we could ever approach for as the truth. And therefore, our truth becomes the intersection of independent lines. And so in, in embracing this approach, I've been working at CSRO with uh, very good statisticians and very good numerical simulation modelers. And we all try to work together to try to converge upon uh, a problem in a, you know, mostly in the marine realm, but I also get to work in, in other spaces as well. So what is a qualitative modeling approach for my um, interest, which is ecosystems? It can be uh, represented by a set of differential equations, which encompasses processes of birth and death. That we have these interaction coefficients here that, um, that's all right. Let me see the mouse. So we have these interaction coefficients, which is the uh, predator-prey interaction term. So that's the, uh, the per capita effect of the predator on the prey and the uh, per capita effect of the prey on the predator through rates of uh, birth are encompassed in this interaction coefficient. I can extract those coefficients and put them into the community matrix or the Jacobian matrix, or you can represent that same uh, information as a sine directed graph or sine digraph where the, the graph uh, vertices here are the population abundance variables. And the links are the per capita rates of interaction where we have the mortality and the birth terms here. So each are equivalent ways of representing the same amount of information qualitatively. And with this framework, you can represent all possible interactions. Uh, yeah, this is recording from a previous lecture I gave and, and it didn't go away. So um, uh, I'll have to keep up. So we have mutualism, commensalism. Come on, move it up. Come on, Jeff, move it. Uh, I don't know what I was talking about. There. Competition, uh, amensalism, and then self-effects. Um, and the self-effects are most typically in biology negative, but if you have a self-enhancing growth, you can get a positive self-effect. And those are more rare and de they destabilize the system. Well done, Jeff. Hey, I'm my own form of AI. <laughs> Okay, so with this uh, rubric, you can represent anything, even um, the contradictory aspect of humor. Um, here we have suddenly telecom stocks soar as usage increases. Sell my telecom stocks, sell my telecom. So what is this about? This is just a negation of sell usage and stock price, creating a negative feedback. Um, so anything that you can, my, my particular gift or role that I play in, in, in creating these models with multidisciplinary approaches is that I listen to narratives that people talk about and I extract out the underlying processes that are there and try to represent them in a sign directed graph form. Um, so you can do it with humor, but you can also do it with things such as uh, economic systems like demand and price, price and production can be those same two variables. Uh, processes of consumption, fecundity and mortality can be predator prey like we just saw, or stimulus response type uh, systems where uh, liver and cell glucose uptake is, uh, leads to uh, glycogen storage based on 
the levels of blood glucose and insulin in the blood. So any of these sorts of processes, if you can, if you can imagine a process, then you can imagine a system. I would really love to turn that laser thing off. I've never seen this happen before, but you're gonna have to suffer through it with me. Um, so based upon these sign directed graphs, what can we do? Basically two things. We can assess the system's potential for stability and how it will react to a, a press perturbation. A stability question is about a pulse perturbation. A pulse perturbation is an instantaneous um, shift in the population abundance. So if you go in and double the amount of predators, you drop in a bunch of uh, foxes by helicopter uh, into a paddock, uh, so that's a, a one-off doubling of the population, then you let the system go and see how the rabbits and foxes uh, adjust over time. And then the system might be such that they're stable, unstable, or neutrally stable. And those assertions can be made up based upon the feedback properties of the system here, uh, F. And then the, uh, whether or not it returns uh, monotonically or oscillatorily uh, is based upon if there's imaginary parts, uh, components in the eigenvalues. And those also can be assessed based upon the feedback properties of the system. So qualitatively, we can make a, a guess as to what sort of trajectory we might have given a, a pulse perturbation. Press perturbations are when you do a permanent shift in parameter. So what if the natural selection gives the predator sharper claws? How will the system respond? Uh, here's a, a positive input to the system where the rabbit uh, maybe gets faster, uh, able to maybe escape the predator, or maybe it gets an input of nutrition or better me metabolic conversion of its food into uh, a rate of birth. Given that positive input to the rabbit, um, of the hair, then what would my, what might we expect in the response of the system? Uh, it would predict that you would get more of the rabbit and then that positive times the positive link here gives a positive response in the predator. Very simple, very logical. Any of these parameters that we can think about up here, the interaction coefficients, rates, intrinsic rates of birth here or death or immigration or emigration, any process that you can think of in ecology can be uh, forced into this simple lot cavalterra linear form of an equation that you see on top. Of course, you can get uh, other forms of equations and they're also amenable to, to analysis. Now, if you have the um, uh, negative input on the top, so you do a calling program for the predator, um, then what happens is you get less predators and that negative times the negative there, link going from predator to prey gives a positive response in the, the hairs, the snowshoe hairs. And now all, all of a sudden we see a difference in response based upon whether or not it's from top down or bottom up. Qualitatively, we would expect input from the bottom of the system to have pos positive correlation structure, covariance structure in the variables, and a negative if coming from the top. So already we can uh, do um, have informative indicators about what's the likely cause of input to the system just based on the correlation structure and how the system responds which is a product purely and simply of the graph structure. This is all independent of parameter strength, just graph structure. Parameter strength is the actual interaction, the, the parametric value that you would put on the alpha, the beta, the delta, okay? That's where the parameter strength comes in. But if you just know the signs of these parameters, then we can do a qualitative assessment of the system dynamics. So, Armed with this tool, what can you do with it? Well, we looked at uh, a, a very large, well done experiment, before after control impact type experiment in the Yukon where Krebs et al. Um, was interested in the classic snowshoe hair cycle. And the snowshoe hair has predators, uh, primary predators are lynx and great horned owls. And they did a, a hair food addition experiment. They fed the rabbits, they fed them rabbit pellets and lo and behold, they got more hairs. They did a uh, predator exclusion where they cut down on the ability of predators to get into the control plots, but not uh, totally eliminated them. So they um, suppressed their immigration rate into those control plots and or the experimental plots. And they found that hairs increased. And then when they did food and exclusion together, they had a multiplicative positive increase in hairs. But when they fertilized the vegetation, they saw a vast flourishing of the vegetation, obviously a, a, a good response in the vegetation, 
but no change in hairs, a neutral response. And this, this puzzled them. And they said in the end, they said, well, feeding, uh, feeding hairs through uh, fertilization is just a poor treatment effect because we weren't able to achieve anything. Um, and we thought that odd. We thought, well, um, you had more vegetation. Why didn't the hairs respond? Um, and so we, we set to think about this in terms of another tool that you can use um, is you can use sign directed graphs to, or qualitative modeling to try to understand what inputs could have been responsible, or what, what model structure could have led to the result. So you're, uh, I'll tell you later that the uh, predictions that you gain, which are here before you, are, are come from the inverse matrix. Um, but if you invert the inverse matrix and work backwards from your predictions to your model, then you can see what models could po possibly have led to that result. And we came up with only one model, okay, that was, that was reasonable to discuss, and that was model B here. So what you have is the columns, uh, positive input to vegetation would lead to, now follow my, oh no, I don't get a mouse. I guess I have to touch the screen. Uh, okay, yeah, let's do that. That's right, we had, we had done the recording of it instead. Can you see my mouse? Good. So this column here was a Krebs et al. experiment. They, um, not only the Krebs et al. experiment, but all experiments that have ever been done on this the snowshoe hair system in the Yukon, we put into this table. So these are results, uh, a meta-analysis, if you will, of all the experiments that have been done on snowshoe hair and their predators. So um, it's, they have done inputs to predators and, and harvested negative responses in hairs. Um, they've done inputs to hairs and found positive response in hairs. And they've had inputs to vegetation and found positive response in hairs, but for the Krebs experiment, they got a basically a zero here. Um, this model A was the conceptual model that they carried through their research program. Model B could plausibly give the results. Um, another model, model C, if you will, was identical to model B, except it had the predators eating vegetation. So we discounted that because there's no evidence that lynx eat grass or willows, neither do great horned owls. So we discounted that out of first principles. So we're left with model B. Model B says that if you have an input to vegetation, there's a positive link from vegetation to hairs. Hairs increase their rate of birth. But also there is some sort of effect on predators which favors them. And that has a negative impact on hairs. You get a negative link to hairs. Um, we, I was a fisheries biologist in Oregon when I did this. I had no idea what it could have meant, but I just put it up as a plausible explanation for what was going on. Thing is, you don't have to trust the fisheries biologist from Oregon. You can go out and do a new experiment because um, what we found, oh, I should have said that when they were publishing their paper, one of the, um, one of the other alternative, not alternative, one of the other science programs in this research did a uh, behavioral study on lynx and found that they were ambush predators. They like to sit behind vegetation and leap out at their prey to ambush them. So we thought it's plausible that the a little bit more vegetation that hides the predator that much better might be more make them more effective predators. And so we said, what well, you don't have to trust us. You can go out and do a critical experiment that nobody's done in the well now seven year history of research in this area. Um, if you have an input to hair and measure the predators, which they can do, then you would have a chance to falsify or to, to find out which model is most consistent with the results. So an additional experiment is suggested by the simple use of qualitative modeling to review the results and see if they're consistent with the conceptual model that the research program was operating in. Um, here's another example of qualitative modeling in terms of um, providing some insight. Um, Peter Yotzitz uh, looked at the Benguela ecosystem where they had a very robust set of data on of, of stomach content and food web um, uh, linkages. And they were able to construct, this is an early version of EcoPath, you might say, 
It's a compartment flow model where they accounted for roughly at least 80% of the birth and mortality terms for the uh, uh, species of interest, which was cod. There's two species of, uh, oh, excuse me, hake, excuse me, hake. <clears throat> so there's two species of hake and the fishermen were complaining that the seals were eating all the hake. And would you allow us to shoot the seals so that those pet predator losses would not impact our fishery? So that was put forward to the management uh, council quite strenuously over time. And so Peter Yotes had said, well, is it conceivable that it would even work? So he did a numerical simulation model and he, uh, based on that food web structure there, he parameterized the uh, systems of equations with you know, a good approximation of parameters from their food web, from the diet studies. And then he found, yes, on average, you can improve the yield of hake to the fishery if you kill seals. So the modeling, the quantitative numerical simulation modeling appeared to hold up, uh, or was consistent with what the fishermen wanted. They wanted to kill the seals to get more fish in the fishery. Uh, but um, <clears throat> Andre Punt said, well, Peter, God, and these guys are friends, right? They sat on the same council. He said, you have a lot of equations there. Gee, so maybe we should just do it with three equations. Uh, maybe that can get some information there. So um, he did that with the, the, the system on the left there. And he just said, well, seals, hake, fish, fish is fishery. Sorry, that, well, that laser pointer is, means the fishery, not the fish. Um, and or actually there's two species of hake. There's a Malusi, the Malusius capensis and um, Malusius paradoxus. Capensis lives on the shelf in the shallow water, say less than, a, uh, less than 100 meters, but uh, on the shelf, it gets much deeper. So there's a deep water, Malusius paradoxus. Um, the juveniles of paradoxus recruit from the shallow shelf waters where during that time that they're on the shelf, they are prey of the adults of capensis. So there's a predator-prey interaction between the juvenile of one hake and, and the adult of the other. And the seals only live on the shelf, okay? So there's two fisheries as well. There's the shallow water or nearshore fishery, and then there's the offshore fishery in the deep water. And the bigger boats, different crew, totally different fishery. Um, so <clears throat> if you do a qualitative analysis of these equations, and what you find is that yes, the simple model, a single Hanks model, this has the same simplifying assumption as the more complicated model on the left. There's one compartment for, for hake, right? One compartment for hake here, one species, so to speak, combined guild. Um, if you do a qualitative input to this and kill seals, then yes, you get more hake and more fish in the fishery. If you do it to this model, then you get the same result for the shallow water system, you get less seals, more adult, a capensis species of hake, um, and more fish to the fishery for the shallow water fishery. But you get less of the juveniles here because they're a significant predator from that predation process. And that then flows down to the adults here and less hake delivered to this fishery. Turns out 80% of the landings come from the deep water fishery. So if you do the seal calling, and it behaves like the model on the right, then you will have less hate delivered to the fishery overall. This is what is called model structure uncertainty. So there's two sources of model structure, model uncertainty. There's parametric uncertainty and model structure uncertainty. And Banks, he did a nice installation where he talked about the elephant in the middle of the room. But long before Banks, he did this in 2006, I met Scott Fearson. And he's told me that model structure and certain is the elephant in the middle of the room that no one talks about. And I believe it's true since that time that I talked to him about that when he visited Australia. I found it's pervasive around the world and really hasn't changed that much. Uh, the, the implications of model structure uncertainty include, uh, or the types of it, uh, there's between models, different interactions or variables, uh, like I just showed you, the one hake model or the two hake. Uh, there's also uncertainty within model because you have a complex and opposing interactions can lead to uh, structural uncertainty.
Oh, well, um, they didn't do it. They decided not to, to do the call. Um, yeah, is the model right? Well, they didn't test, they didn't do the test, right? But hold that thought because later on, I think we, I want to get to the point of testing the model. But uh, I think you can see that if you're on the precipice of allowing chromium seals, especially in 2020, you would better have your, your narrative well crafted. And that's what I would call a seemingly well crafted narrative because, oh gosh, look at how precise we are. But we're precisely potentially wrong. Yeah. Oh, okay. I don't know if you caught that. He said you have to have your hakes in a row. I think. Yeah. Okay. So now I want to just uh, break away from that and show you how qualitative modeling can be applied to diverse settings. Here we had the need to populate a compartment flow model for uh, the Ningaloo Reef System, where we're looking at the impact of tourism on the west coast of Australia, where there's this wonderful fringing reef, coral fringing reef, not unlike the Great Barrier Reef. Um, it's absolutely magnificent and it's heavily impacted by tourism. And so we're building some models of eutrophication in the inner lagoon systems and trying to understand the flow through those. And we're doing a lot of LIDAR and uh, um, hydrodynamic modeling to understand the flow uh, patterns through the uh, reefs, but that information wasn't going to come in our research program for another year and a half or so, and we needed to get the basic structure of the numerical simulation models up and running ahead of time so that we can receive the data and be on schedule with our project. And so in the space of an afternoon uh, during a tea break, I talked to Graham Simons and asked him, geez, how does he, he had done some theoretical work on uh, cross reef currents uh, over the shelf, over eco, uh, coral reef shelves, reef flats. And I said, well, how does that work? You know, can I, can I uh, you know, explain what's going on to me? He, he, he explained the neighbor Stokes equations, uh, which I had dabbled with a little bit, never fully understood, but he uh, revealed them in a two dimensional um, depiction that I could then, um, unpack his paper and his narrative and come up with a, a qualitative approach to it. First off, the wave propagation creates a surf zone that, that wedge of water in the dotted line. And then that, that creates a, um, a gradient of um, pressure that then creates a velocity flowing inland from right to left across the reef flat. Now, the velocity of, of that flow uh, is temperamental and nonlinear, and uh, for going from low to high tide, it's nonlinear. And it goes from low to mid tide, it is a negative downward function and inflects that mid tide. And as you go into high tide, the velocity increases. Okay, so there's a nonlinear nonlinearity in this uh, relationship. But given armed with those principles, I was able to do a sign directed graph that showed that uh, velocity. Is, a, is in sort of a predator-prey type relationship with the thickness of the wedge of water that's from wave propagation in the surf zone. And that is fed by wave energy, both the velocity and zeta. And then we have the distance, which I haven't showed you yet, I'll show you in the next slide. The distance from the outlet of the lagoon has a negative effect on that velocity. The width of the reef flat itself has a negative effect on velocity. And then the tidal stage has either a negative or a positive effect on velocity, depending upon which side of the threshold you are or on the right-hand side. So given this very simple depiction, I was able to construct a, a crude two-dimensional overview of the dynamics of reef flow over the crest, is what Beth Fulton needed to get the first generation of the compartment flow model going for her purposes. So what, what we found was that basically as you get closer to, uh, as you get further away from the outlet of the lagoon, so the water, this is the wave area here, the top of the slide is land, this, this area here is lagoon water, and this is the reef flat here, this, these little, uh, this wedge here, these two wedges. So the vector of velocity is greatest right here, where you're close to the outlet outflow here, this is the outflow. And as you move away from it, 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 it degrades in, in force or velocity. 
but as you have a, a narrowing of the the shelf or the, the reef the reef shelf there, uh, the velocity will increase. Uh, you get so far away from here, you get a null point where there is no net flow over the reef zone because uh, it's too far away from the outlet. Now at high wave energy, that null, that null point is further away from the lagoon outlet and at low wave energy, it shrinks in like an accordion. So this is just in like an accordion. And but given this basic template, you can get a, just a first order qualitative understanding about the general flow dynamics in the lagoon over the reef shelf. Anya Waite did some chlorophyll and plankton uh, measurements uh, along uh, sample sites along these vectors, you might say, along these arrows, and found that as you got going across the reef, the uh, polyps of the corals stripped out very effectively over um, you know, 70, 80% of the uh, plankton out of the water very efficient feeders of the water flowing over the reef. So chlorophyll A was just one of the things, but it was just all picoplankton, zooplankton, um, even viral uh, um, elements in the water. They, the, the, the polyps are taking it out through the mucilaginous layers on them. They're, they're just stripping out all of that potential food. So that's what they feed on. So um, then there's coral scrapers. Uh, Oh, I mean, so, sorry, that's coral, uh, excuse me, plankton and then coral. And then there are these fish that scrape, but they're not killed, but just scrape the polyp surfaces of the coral and that's their food, okay? So we have a very simple food web here. And uh, based on first principles from the qualitative model and this interpretation of food, uh, you could come up with a hypothesis for grazing hotspots and make a hypothesis about where fish populations would be higher uh, than other places, okay? And I did all this in one afternoon based upon the lectures I heard in the auditorium that day. And I showed it to Graham and I showed it to Anya Wayne and said, what do you guys think of this? I said, yeah, but maybe it will work and they went off and we just fed it into the research program. Never really got published, but I, I think it's a good teaching tool to show you what you can do. And then you, of course, you have to go validate it. Well, just two weeks later, I was off with my family in Samoa just so happened we're on a fringing coral reef and our uh, village that we're staying at was over here, <clears throat> basically. And I begged and pleaded with one of the villagers to take me out fishing because I like to fish. So see, I'll take you fishing. So he liked to fish with a net. I was fishing with a spear gun. And the village was here. I thought he was just gonna take me across to the reef flat out here, but no. He hooked a left turn and went all the way over here and he went right there to fish. I said, why are you going there? He says, well, we like this species of fish, which I later found out. Our children love it, it's their favorite food. So he's feeding his kids. Their favorite food are coral scrapers. And that's where the highest population is, all right? So that is sample size one, degrees of freedom, what, zero. But I, have, I feel I have just validated this model. Um, Perhaps you could suggest a better way, Scott, but I think I've done a pretty good job at least at this point of the lecture, uh, but we can try to do better. Um, I might be some new government statements, so. It's <laughs> pretty wrong. Okay, so I've showed you really simple models, three variables, right? Nothing. So what do you do with something like this? Remember that snowshoe hair one had three variables, but it had an ambiguity, right? You can go directly from vegetation to hares or go from vegetation to predators to hares. And look, you have two colliding uh, effects, a direct and indirect effect that have opposite sign. So the uh, response of hares could be ambiguous. It could be positive, negative, or zero. You don't know, or you know, unmeasurable, or close to zero. Well, what happens in something more uh, complicated like this? Well, if you have a positive input to epiphytic algae, in the red square on the right, what's the, it, which is in competition with coral, uh, what's the likely response of coral? Well, if it was just gonna be algae and coral out just within the red box, there is no ambiguity. Coral would go down because there's only one direct link from epiphytic algae to coral. But if you add on the system surrounding those two variables, we come up with an, an additional 357 or total of 358 effects that emanate 
from that perturbation to algae that will have a direct and indirect effect on coral. 82 of those effects are, are, will be positive. 276 of those effects propagating through the network structure of the system will be negative. If you just do a rough calculation, you could say, well, 82 positive, 276 negative, there's 194 net negative effects out of a total of 358. Okay, what would you guess? Would, would, what you, if you were a betting person and you didn't know the parameter strength of all of those linkages in the system, what would you bet, given that information? Would you bet that it was gonna be a positive or negative effect on coral? And uh, is it even proper to ask that question with a room with people like you, or is it like, you know? Yeah, betting, betting would go up. Yeah, so who, raise your hand if you think it's gonna be negative. Raise your hand if it's going to be positive. Raise your hand if you don't care, you're too afraid to answer. <laughs> you, didn't, you didn't raise a hand. Okay. Well, okay. This was the central problem of my PhD thesis because Richard Levins developed the technique. And he applied it to variable or models with variables, of typically five or less variables, where you could understand the symbolic inequalities of the pathways and you only had a handful of competing direct and indirect effects to, to determine that, well, if these are stronger than these, then they'll likely be one way or the other in strength. You could do it in your head with the snowshoe hair example I showed you, right? But I was interested in something that was, where well, you couldn't do that, where the, uh, where the ambiguities were outstrip the uh, ability of, of human cognition to keep track of. Clearly, 358 effects the symbolic inequalities that come out of that are, there's no human being that can do it. It's, it's too convoluted of an argument to, to make sense of. So I came up with the notion of creating a prediction weight where you take the net divided by the total number of effects and that makes a ratio of 0.54, okay? So that's the ratio of the net to total number of effects. And then I said, well, if I was to test that against numerical simulation approaches, um, I could ask how likely is a negative effect? Because my qualitatively, the net effect is supposed to be negative. So if you're a betting person, you would say it was likely gonna be negative. So that's the, that's the sign of the adjoint matrix you'll find out later, it gives you that negativity. Um, turns out that the probability of a negative response is equal to nine, uh, 0.98. Okay, only 2% of the time will those positive effects overwhelm all of those negative effects in random parameter space. And how do I get to say that? Well, I, for my thesis, I just created the top row. I did a random parameter space that was just a flat. I just did a equal likelihood of, of strength uh, picked randomly from the interval from uh, between zero and one. And I took it down to one, two, three, or four, or five orders of magnitude difference between the weakest and the strongest. I always allowed the strongest to be one. And then I would vary the parameter space between uh, point, point 0.1 and one, and point 0.01 and one, and point 0.001 and one, and just kept getting weaker until I didn't get uh, a result that I thought was of any importance and difference, right? And it only took a couple of orders of magnitude before I seemed to have found how weak something needs to be for it to be weak in effect, right? The weakest that matters. It can go beyond, it just doesn't make any difference. So it? I don't really care. Um, so that's, that's one assertion I make. Um, and then when I did this work again with, with CSIRO, we added on the lower three distributions and um, did skewed right and left and normal. And the, the clouds of points are there um, in, in these columns. The, uh, the graph panels. Now, what you'll see is that the clouds of points are roughly equivalent, that the different distributions didn't have a, they're, they're, they're a little different, but not a lot different. What really made a difference was the difference between the second and the third panel, what we call dependence. That really exploded out the, the distribution. You can see that there's, that uh, below the dotted line on the, in the middle, there's no points hardly any points, whereas the dependence has many points below the dotted line. 
So you, you could get really wrong opposite results um, more readily um, you know, from the qualitative predict predictions if you had dependence. By dependence, I mean that a predator-prey uh, interaction is never randomly allocated. The prey provide the predator a lunch, and in return, they receive a funeral. So it's how many rabbits does a predator need to eat before it makes a baby is the difference in per capita effect, right? So the positive effect in the predator-prey interaction will almost always be stronger than the negative. Oh, excuse me, weaker than the negative, right? So if we embed that dependence into our numerical simulation, so for that graph on the left, every time there's a predator-prey interaction, I would think of uh, an alloc uh, a numerical allocation rule that you would always have to be some magnitude less than the, 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 the negative if you're the positive. And in so doing, it, it, it creates a, a bigger scatter of uncertainty. But even then, the central tendency is not unlike that on the, the, the middle panel. So this then, if you use the central tendency of these uh, clouds of points, then it provides a means to do an assertion of, of likelihood of getting a correct sign determinancy in from your qualitative model if that model was to undergo or to represent something that was randomly allocated parameter space. So it allows you to say that, that, that I could trust that to be roughly out of you know, numerical simulations, 98% of the times a prediction with a 0.5 or greater, I'm gonna get correct 98% of the time. I'm just totally confused because W is the net positives over the total, right? Yeah, but it's arbitrary what the sign is. It's, the, it's just the weight that matters. And then you worry about if the sign is correct. Or well, it's, it's a number. In some sense, the likelihood of Positive effects on the coral? Oh, it is. 2% um, of the time. But, yeah. but, but like, they're twice as likely to have positive effects in W, it says, but it says that probably the negative response is equal to 0.98. Uh, it was 194 was a negative number. I took the absolute value of it. Sorry. Can you please repeat Scott's question? It wasn't very it's audible. Used by, um, rightly so, that this is a negative number here. Uh, 194. Oh, sorry, it was negative. Yeah. Uh, okay. But when I put it into the, the, the W, I take the absolute value of it. It doesn't matter what the sign is so at that point. Were, they were overall large Yes, yeah. 98% of the time, the numerical simulations return a negative result, but 2% of the time, those, these effects here overwhelmed all of those, okay? Right, and we also did a quantile regression where we uh, enveloped the cloud of points so that we would say, you know, take 95%, a cloud that would envelop 95% of the points and take the lower edge of that as our reading of probability. So in, oops, sorry. So instead of reading that red line off of the central tendency, we would read it off the edge of an envelope around. around. Somebody had a question? No, no, sorry, I was just putting the microphone on. So if someone asks a question, then can use my laptop to. Oh, okay. Ask it. Right. Okay. So I just wanted to tell you that we could, we're, we're very, you know, general in our approach. We're just saying, use whatever uh, distribution you want. We have algorithms that would let you do any of these. Um, and we did a central tendency approach or uh, the edge of a cloud of points, the quantile regression, uh, if you want to be more conservative. Um, but anyway, it doesn't really matter to us. We just wanted a tool to come up with a way to assess differences in uh, likeliness of sign determinancy of a specific qualitative prediction within a, a system like that. And so here's just a, a, a deep, just a slightly deeper understanding of what's going on. In a very simple approach, um, you could take two pathways between X and Y. 
one of which is negative and one positive. If it's negative, it goes through a red circle. And if you randomly allocate parameter strength to those four links in front of you, then you'll get a positive and negative response 50-50 time, 50% 50 of the time. Um, now, if you have two pathways, positive and one negative, then the prediction weight is 0.3 because one of these gets to cancel one of those, you're left with one net, one divided by three is 0.3. Similarly, now we get to four overall pathways, one negative, three positive, prediction weight of 0.5. When you get to that, you're up near 90, 95% sign determinancy for the positive to always win out over the negative. Then you have the same prediction weight, 0.5, but now it's four net to eight total. Now you get up to 99.9%. Why is the same prediction weight giving such a different, well, it's not that different, but a, it's, a, it's nearly impossible for these two red to overwhelm those six blue. Well, that's the basic logic of the central limit theorem, is it not? Large numbers are hard to move, a large mass of numbers. So when you have a large set of feedbacks, it's harder for, the, uh, the opposing side, so to speak, to overwhelm the, the other. So based upon the uh, prediction weight and the absolute number of links or number of effects in the prediction, we are able to then to create these um, different central tendencies. And that's what you see here. You see there's three lines through the cloud of points in the middle. One of those is, is just to say that that's if it's 10 number of links or 100 or 1,000. And the central tendency through those, through those is, is different. different predict same prediction weight, different absolute number of links. This gives you three different curves through that cloud of points. This, this, this was you know, maybe 50,000 points are on there. They superposition, so you don't see them all. But there's, just a, there's a whole lot of points on these graphs that we just put into one uh, illustration. So then we, what, do I do, what I do is I use this then to create uh, predictions for larger systems that are greater than five variables, which was kind of the previous limit when you had to do it by hand. So here's an application I did uh, during COVID. I did this through workshops on uh, Zoom and WebEx, where I talked to scientists from all over the world, deep sea uh, biologists about what the likely effect would be from polymetallic sulfide mining along the mid-Atlantic Ridge area. Here, they were gonna go after um, vents. They're not going to, but they're saying, if they did go after these vents, deep sea vents, what would be the impact to the biota? And this particular model is the very area adjacent to the vents that aren't being mined, but they'd have the indirect impacts from plumes and equipment on the seafloor and also uh, activity of the ships up top that are tending to the mining um, product. And so we have a surface pelagic system in blue, a deep pelagic in uh, yellow, and then a demersal benthic system in, uh, I guess that's purple or something. And the, the examples of the sort of biota in the models. And then we ask them to document the linkages in the model. So what's the references that lead to understanding that these different positive negative effects in the food web? Those are the list of references. So we, you know, I like to document the, the science underpinning the model as best I can. And then I looked at uh, different pressure scenarios or perturbation scenarios where we have each of these pressures as one off um, impacts to the system that would perturb certain variables, surface light, surface noise, turbidity discharged at the surface, nutrients coming from the surface discharge, um, seafloor noise, things at the bottom. These are, these are all the different pathways of interactions uh, according to like the Dipser framework or the pressure state interaction. It took about, this, this particular group was cantankerous. This was my worst group because they were really just incredulous that, that the International Seabed Authority would even ask whether or not this was possible. Rather, to, but to contribute to the risk assessment was seen as like, oh my God, but they, they, they participated. But 
after about four, four or five workshops, I won them over. Um, and they said, oh, this is actually a good method. But they, at the beginning, they, they were dragged in kicking and screaming. Yeah. Yeah, but normally I can do it in one or two workshops of this four hours length. And usually what I did before COVID, I'd show up in a room like this and I'd go one to two days. Then we would attack a problem and I'd go away, write it up, send it out, get it reviewed, do that all remote. Yeah. Usually, I mean, it only takes, if people know what they're, if it's a, the most important part is to define the scope of the problem. Well, that's, and that's listing the, the various items, right? So, mm -hmm. and then it helps out to sign the fund. Yeah, and that, we do that in the comfort of home. Give me the reference for that, you know, and follow that up. Yeah, I don't expect them to have it in sight. I only ask people to come with their knowledge, not their, not their books, yeah. just their heads. Okay, so then I run the perturbations. Oh, go on. We can go back to that. You sure? Okay, so then given these one off perturbations, here's the predictions of how that system would respond to each individual pressure on the system. Okay, so there's winners and losers. Um, there's always going to be winners and losers in a food web because, not unless it's like your atomic bomb type pressure. Um, and then we did combinations of perturbations where we did surface discharge uh, or seafloor discharge with different combinations. And there was uncertainty, I should say. Um, the, the light might have a positive effect on the feeding rate of, of seagulls or a negative effect. They didn't know. There's epistemic uncertainty. No, that is S1A where Pause, light has a positive effect at the surface or it has a negative effect, but with surface discharge held constant. So we'd have a surface discharge pressure, two different pressures, but one of the pressures is uncertainty, has uncertainty. So we would do both positive and negative impacts of that additional unknown pressure included and run that through as a scenario. So this is how, hmm? well, we just say we, we would do a model with a negative effect and then do another model with a positive effect. We have two different models to represent the uncertainty. So that's how we uh, approach epistemic uncertainty is we just embed it within different model structures and then analyze all a suite of models with a suite of perturbations. I'll get to that. So then we have uh, these suites of perturbation combinations and I guess I, I should have explained in the last one, but it's the same, is the perfect, a perfect negative prediction, a prediction weight of one. So every impact that goes to that variable could be 50 direct and indirect effects. Every one of them is negative. There is no room for error. There can never ever be positive. If it is, the model's wrong, right? That would be a, a red, prediction. A pure blue prediction similarly is positive. All uh, direct and indirect effects from the perturbation variable to the response variable are positive. If you set a threshold saying, oh, I think anything over 85% likelihood is, you could call it quote unquote, likely negative or likely positive, then you can entertain the orange and the light blue squares. But you could slide that level of acceptance anywhere you want. You can make it 95%, 85, 80, um, you know, whatever you want, or perfectly zero. Zero means that there are no linkages going from an input variable to a response variable. It can only ever be zero. If it was anything other than zero, then the model's wrong, okay? And then you have anything that falls below the threshold of likely, positive or negative, then it's just called unknown. Big question mark, it could be positive or negative. That's like the snowshoe hair. The snowshoe hair had one positive, one negative from that model B. And that is by prediction weights, that's indeterminate. Unless you know. The other way to handle indeterminacy yeah, outside of this framework is to say, well, I do know that the trophic effects are greater than the behavioral effects. And then you would say that it would be positive but that's a condition you impose on the model, logically, a logical condition, which is how Richard Levins developed loop analysis or qualitative modeling. 
He addressed ambiguity through logical condition statements. The other way we use qualitative modeling in a risk assessment framework is to take them and allow us to focus our attention on that most critical aspect of the system that's gonna be needed for the risk assessment or for the definition of a safe operating space. And then we do a proper uh, Bayesian uh, general linearized model uh, with constructed scenarios with expert elicitation. This is what Jeff Hosack and Keith Hayes are excelling in right now we're doing. So we use my work to focus the attention of the experts on the critical part of the system that we need to worry about, uh, to boil down all that complexity to a simple, uh, a more simple uh, subject for uh, uh, in-depth elicitation. And we're going to use that to define hopefully safe operating spaces or thresholds of risk that are important to their analysis. Um, and then we need to embed that into a spatial context. So we have these zones of influence, as we call them, where there's high, medium, and low levels of risk from your dose response type relationship. So this sort of dose response type relationship needs to be elicited or somehow measured in a laboratory. Uh, and then if we have that tool, then we can put this whole framework into a spatial context and say, you know, in a mining operation or in a discharge situation, these are the areas where we think you're going to have impacts and these are going to be the winners and losers and at some point we can draw a dotted line and say everyone agrees that's weak enough we don't need to worry about that anymore that because pollution has been done the dilution so there's our solution type uh, phrase whatever that is however it's agreed upon in the management framework now i want to jump jump forward into an application for a 10 variable problem with eutrophication in Danish shallow lakes. This was the model structure. Oh, and these are decades, decades and decades of research that have been uh, synthesized by uh, Jeppesen and others uh, just before the turn of the century. Um, so there's a real, this is where there's deep, deep knowledge about the ecosystem. And I took their description of how the, the world worked. You have uh, submerged plants, um, invertebrates, phytoplankton, zooplankton, uh, zo uh, planktivorous fish like, like cyprinids and predatory fish like pike. And then you have swans that ate the, the vegetation. You had ducks that ate the uh, invertebrates. And you had uh, cormorants and others that ate the fish. So a nice, tidy little ecosystem. And when you throw enough phosphorus, phosphorus into it, you get a uh, turbid lake and, and you have this art, um, alternative states between turbid and clear state that, that happens in that transition between the mesophilic and the eutrophic state. So I drove up a mesotrophic model and then a eutrophic model, and then for fun, a trophic interactions only model. I haven't really described to you, but these light blue linkages are nonlinear interactions. They come from things that are not purely uh, predator prey, not, um, what's it called, mass, not mass balance, but uh, it's called interaction though. But the interaction coefficients are, um, oh, I'm sorry, but if you have, it's based upon a linear interaction coefficient between two variables. Uh, it's the basic lotka Volterra interaction term. When that term is affected by another variable, then its uh, per capita effect becomes non-linear. And so examples of that are that zooplankton hide in the macrophytes during the day to escape predation by cyprinids. So the amount of macrophytes in the shallow lake suppresses the predator-prey intensity between cyprinids and zooplankton. Similarly, when you get enough plankton in the water in a eutrophic state, it becomes turbid and the phytoplankton in the water keep piscivorous fish from seeing their cyclone of prey. Um, so that leads to these suppression of the predator prey links adds these new links here. Macrophytes suppress cyprinids rate of feeding and reduce zooplankton's rate of mortality. Phytoplankton suppress piscivorous rates of predation and diminish cyprinids rate of mortality. So that turns into new positive 
and negative effects in the system. Um, phytoplankton can shade macrophytes and keep them from growing. So that's a negative effect. And above a certain threshold, macrophytes do not enjoy any more growth rate from additional nutrients because they're maxed out. So that's a type, uh, type one functional response. So it's above the threshold. So that means that that positive link is, is severed, okay? So this is the same model without those nonlinear interactions. Um, and this is the mesotrophic model that retains the zooplankton cyprinid interaction. Okay? So if you go through the literature and there's a vast amount of it, you can uh, make the predictions and compare them to the experimental results. And when you look at the mesotrophic model, it, there were 10 uh, experiments to compare to and it got all of them correct in the predictions. Eutrophic model had 16 correct, two incorrect. All of those that were incorrect were below the threshold of 0.5. So you might say that they're forgivable errors or sins in prediction. The trophic interactions only model were tested against 18 uh, predictions, uh, 10 of which were correct, eight were incorrect, and all of those eight had prediction weights above 0.5. So those were less forgivable sins, so to speak. So on the balance, you would say that the mesotrophic model and the eutrophic model uh, performed much better than the trophic interactions normal model. How better? I don't know. I think perhaps, uh, perhaps we can do better than this, but that's why we took it to the next step of trying to put it into a base net. So that's what Scott wanted me to talk about. So based upon, these clouds of points and these assertions about the central tendency, or if you will, the, uh, the edge effect, or just the cloud of points, wherever you want to type your information for probability, you can make an assertion about the prediction weight and the total number of effects in a prediction and say, what's the probability of, of a qualitative prediction being correct in a randomly attributed parameter space? Our hope is that such an exercise has some useful reflection upon the real world. That's the long bow that is drawn in this presentation. Well, how you do it is you take those probabilities and they, you can write some maple code and make them populate a conditional probability table. So these conditional probabilities come purely from the sign directed graph predictions. And I've arranged it such that there is a parent node at the top that compares model structures. There is a null model. A null model is simply a qualitative model with the same number of links that has nothing but ones in the community matrix or positives everywhere. All self-effects are positive. All uh, interactions between every variable are purely mutualistic. And in such a model as that, it predicts every outcome with equal likelihood. So for any perturbation to the system of a null model, it gives equal likelihood that every other variable will either increase, decrease, or not change with equal likelihood. So it's, it's a perfect thing to compare to. It's like a coin toss, if you will, but I'm, I'm afraid to say such euphemisms in front of people like you because you have a better idea of probability theory than I ever will have. Um, but anyway, that's the, 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 that's the framework we've used to, uh, we have to have an alternative model, at least one, compare it to a null model. And then we have uh, variables nodes in the center, which represent the behavior of the sign directed graph variables. And then we have the nodes at the bottom are inputs. They're also a parent node. So if you, have, if you choose to have an input to R and you choose to have an input to P, but choose not to consider an input to C1 or C2, then you end up with two input nodes at the bottom. But those are arbitrary. They're at however you want to do an input to the system. Okay. So given this structure, you can do four analytical functions. You can make an assertion about the truth of a model. So if you entertain, and I'll do some more of this with real Bayes nets in a moment, so you get to see it work out. But if you predict, if you make an assertion about model one is correct 100% and that there's been an input to P but not to R, then the, this is the sign directed graph predictions that come out of it, that you would get an increase in P, a decrease in C1 and 2, and an increase in R. Now, you don't need the Bayes net to tell you this. I can just do the qualitative 
modeling exercise and give you the same information. So this is just a representation of what the sign directed graph will tell you, okay? So it's just a way to visualize it. What's not so easy is to do the next one. I can't do this easily, as easily in, in, in classic qualitative modeling approach. It's that's to diagnose the source of input. It can be done, but it's, it's a little more difficult. Um, so you make the same assertion about model one being correct. Then you make observations. You say, I've observed that there's been an increase in P, no change in C1 or C2, and an increase in R. What is the likely cause of such an observation? And it gives overwhelming evidence. It suggests overwhelmingly that input to R was likely the, the cause of that observation. Right? Can we see that? That, 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 that says, it, and there's like, it's unchanged here at P. So, so these observations are most consistent with an input to, to R and not to P, okay? Then you can test model structure. You can make observations in the middle nodes like we just did. You can make an assertion about a source of input and is your model structure, is a sign directed graph consistent with those observations? No, it turns out that the null model is more consistent with an increase in P and a decrease in R, no change to C1 and C2, given an input to P. Okay, those observations cannot be accounted for by graph structure. So therefore the graph is falsified. So we can test model structure. The last thing we can do is identify formative indicators. We can say um, under model one, um, if we want to know what, it, if, there, if we want to diagnose if there's been an input to R, what is the most sensitive variable to measure? What's the most informative indicator to tell us how the system responds to, due to an input to R? So sensitivity of input to R to a finding at another node the neutral information, uh, the baseline is the input to R itself. That's tantamount to asking God, you know, if you know if there's input to R, just, just have perfect knowledge. I guess that's how it works. That's, that's ranked as 100%. Of course, that's what you compare to. And then the next best thing to measure is R, and, R or P give you 83% neutral information to knowing if you actually knew about input to R. But less informative are C1 and C2. C1 and C2 are poor monitoring variables for this question. So you can use this as a first test approach to identify informative indicators, which is what we're doing, which is what I'm doing for the risk assessment work I'm doing with deep sea mining. Um, of course, you would take this list of indicators and say, well, can you even measure it? Is it cost effective? Uh, is the signal noise you know, useful? You know, all the things that you have to do to vet a monitoring variable. But this gives you a short list of things that may be informative. And this is my thing to tell me to go and give you an example in Medica. So I'm going back to that Danish Shallow Lakes example. Oh, I go to more and I go to Yep. Okay. So here's an example where you say, I'm going to have no, no input to cyprinids or macrophytes, but I'm going to have an increase in nutrients. And we're going to do it in the eutrophic model. So this says that if you're in a eutrophic state and you increase the nutrients, that you're going to get less macrophyte eating birds less macrophytes, more um, birds that eat fish, and more cyprinids, and more phytoplankton. But you're gonna have a lot more ambiguity in some of the other variables, okay? So this is just doing that prediction. Um, if I have an input to the nutrients and I make um, some observations like Sorry, that. Yeah. Yep. ambiguity in this context, you just mean that the probabilities associated with those different things are kind of close to yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, there's, you have less, for, like, for, in, in, for instance, with invertebrates, it's like 50% of the time it could go down, but 
you might say if you go up or not change at all. Whereas, you know, it's just, and I want my people to think about this in very crude ways. There's no way I want anybody to get excited about the difference between 57.3 and 46.9, all right? If you think that's important, then you're overextending these results. Um, and I, I have students all the time who want to make really important assertions about things that I think you just, this is a very, as you can see, the logic train that's involved with this is a very, very long bow. So um, I want this to be used as a first cut approximation about how we think the system might behave, uh, but I would never um, make strong assertions based upon this, this representation. Um, so that, here's a, a situation, I gotta put my glasses on now. So the nice thing is you can do, as you probably know, you can do cases. Um, No, well, to put it another way, if these model, if the model structure that I'm entertaining, that is based upon decades. Well, that's based upon their, their description of the system. I made the model. The model comes with it, a suite of predictions that I can't affect. And they go into the conditional probability table. And then based upon that, the model structure speaks to the, makes the predictions. Is that, I'm not quite sure I understood your question. So I'll go. I'll so go. There's Jefferson who did the work. Yep. Uh, and got the signs on that. Oh, I, I read his experiments and said, oh, he found when he did this treatment that they got more of this and less of that. Okay, so you made the signs. That's fine. I, I extracted them out of the literature. Right. It's a meta analysis. Right. So you populate the, the qualitative model. From the qualitative model, you create CPTs for this, right? Yeah. So, in fact, let's look at one. Those represent your predictions based on the Jefferson observations. These represent the prediction. These, these conditional probabilities in front of you come from the structure of the qualitative model right. only. Right. Yep. On the weights, right? The and, and the equidistribution assumption. Yes. yes. All of the assumptions, everything that, and you know, I. Yep, all of those that clouds of points, and you can use the central tendency of the first, second, third, or fourth panel, or use the second, or use the you know the edge, the ninety-five development of that. Word. However, you want to develop it, you can come up with a independent. You can come up with one, two, three, four, five, eight different styles of initial probabilities. I don't really care. Do whatever you want, whatever makes you happy, you know, because there are so many assumptions there, right? How would I dream to say that this is the best way to depict the entire universe? It's, it would be ridiculous. But whatever distribution you want to cheat, to play with to, to, as a means of first cut interpretation, this allows you to do it. Yeah, it's not, it's not yeah, very useful. You know, there are four of those really blue ones and only two of the red ones. Probably it's blue. Right? That's all I'm saying. And, and that's clearly like a distribution of probably an assumption. But what, what if one of the reds is catastrophic? Yes. It doesn't matter who it is, but it's Mothra and Godzilla. So oh, so so Jesus hates you. <laughs> <laughs> well, if, if the ocean boils, the fish die. You yeah. know how much food you That's true. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And I was, and I'm afraid of Mars attack. To, I mean, <laughs> it's going to happen. How much complexity would you add if you just were like all these steps? That's step why. Wide. Or intensity? Well, I mean, 
like an integer ranks rather than just sum. I wouldn't know what that meant. Well, it's it's bigger than one and smaller than six. But I only entertain the sum. Yes. Sir. If you want to do quantitative things, go for broke. And that's a numerical simulation path. And there's halfway houses between. But right now I'm just doing a purely qualitative science structure approach. Um, there's lots of different, as I, some of my follow-up slides, I'll make the point that there are ways that there's nothing that's purely statistical or purely qualitative or purely numerical simulation, that there are halfway house. You can imagine all sorts of ways to make halfway house models. That's fine, but, uh, but right now I'm just talking about the pure effect of system structure which has, I think, overwhelming, overwhelming effect. And people go on and on and on about parametric and, and you know, sensitivity analyses on one model. And you saw what, what that could do in the Benguela upwelling system with one hate versus two hate with the completely opposite result. So there are so many people doing numerical approaches that are far wiser than I, that I just let them do that. But I'm I particularly I'm deep about this. Hybrid, you know, just it helps. Not sure, but yeah, we can talk yeah, about it. Too. It's certainly a reasonable idea, you can say, partially called it. But, but your argument actually is quite deep, and, 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 and maybe it's right that you know the elephant in the room is screwing things up. You know, he's the thing that determines what's really happening. Um, so his argument is that the quantitative thing is really running the ship, and that the, the other stuff is just. Was it may cause of bells and whistles or window dressing? Yeah, I think so. I think, and I think it's the most underappreciated aspect of ecology. Well, and maybe modeling in general. Yeah. Okay, I wanted to show. By the way, for the non-ecologists, some crinids, fish, macrophytes, or plants, eutrophic and mesotrophic. I don't know about that. High nutrients, low nutrients. Oh. Jeff, can I read a question that Alex has asked? Please do. Please do. Uh, could you explain how you exclude nodes that have very small effects? Presumably, you could throw hundreds of nodes in uh, that would end up giving high predictive capability for size, but they're all basically ineffectual. Uh, then that would be a misuse of time. Is it going to make it hard for me? Um, I think it'll come. I only have to go back to my friend Charles Mingus. There's an art to it. You have to, you have to flip this slide again because I can talk to you about it. Mm. Okay, so that's in the display settings. What have I done? Mention Charles Mingus. Oh, yeah, I mean, it's too much trouble for a slight detour. <laughs> you need to stay there with me. <laughs> <laughs> um, Look, this is, this is the part that I can't teach is, but I, I guess I can. Um, when you make an abstraction for a model, you're in a room full of experts. And there's a lot of people that have spent their whole life studying one life stage of one organism. And if they don't see that in the model, they think the model's a failure. So my job is to bring everybody on to a journey that what I, here's the organizing principle I've come up with is a two word phrase. We search for the relevant subsystem. The relevant subsystem is our goal. It's relevant because you have to pose a problem. That takes up most of the meeting is people just agreeing to what the problem is. And then that comes with an attendant spatial, temporal and organizational structure, processes that do lead to um, growth or demunition of the things of interest, the objects of interest, and more importantly, a lot of other stuff that are peripheral. So we do leave out weak or insignificant, quote unquote, insignificant variables or weak links. But if we suspect that they're important, I never say I have one model. I always play with a suite of models, like I showed you here with the Danish shallow lakes. I always play with model A, B, C, and D because somebody in the room says, my organism is so important, it deserves to be in the model. I say, okay, here it is, here's your model. Now, 
Let's go out and test them. Which ones perform better? Um, and they fall over or they don't. Or the one with all the extra complexity gives the same behavior as the one that's more simple. Then which one do you want to parameterize if you're going to go forward or test it? You know, I, I don't try to choose what reality is. I just try to represent what plausible abstractions of it, useful abstractions of it are. And I use the organizing principle of a relevant substitute because I never pretend to have a whole system. I always say that I'm doing something that meets the needs of our problem. Yeah, but you're, you're certainly the circus. Uh, I am. Yeah. Yeah. And so if you ask the question, if Jeff came back with a different set of people on a different day with the same problem, how close would you get? Well, that's an impossible experiment. I know you can't do that, but you know. Anesthetize Jeff sufficiently. Yeah. Well, you don't need to because all you have to do is just contemplate well, there's going to be different models. Then test them, right? It doesn't matter, right? So I wanted to get back, and I, I shouldn't be doing this now because every time I do this, it, uh, it's difficult for everybody. But, um, Can everyone see the BaseNet again? That's not in this room. Yep, clearly visible. Thank you. I want to make one more point with this. Um, you can do a case, bit case. Macro. So I asked um, Nutrient Press and Neutrophic Lake. So this was a test at how well the models performed, given observations from Yepesins and others decades and decades of research. So this is like the snowshoe hair where it's a meta-analysis of 50 years of research, all fit into those four boxes, so to speak. Similarly here, um, there's been three, really only three inputs to the Danish Shallow Lake system as um, experiments that try to control alternative states between clear and turbid water states. And they are input to macrophytes, input to cyprinids, and input to nutrients. And when you do that, then I've taken the observations from the literature, the meta-analysis, and those are the observations in the middle. And it shows that the neutrophic model is 99.9% .9 level of likelihood as being most consistent with observed observations as opposed to the mesotrophic model, the trophic only interactions model, or the null model. Okay. Is there something? Well, that's a good idea. Yeah. Now let's just see how easy it is to knock the uh, mesotrophic model out though. What if we, uh, all you have to do is make a few observations like that. And all of a sudden the null model beats the shallow, the uh, eutrophic model. So these qualitative models are very easy to falsify. Um, and you don't even need good rigor or precise data. Like um, I had one study where they didn't bother to measure the amount of macroalgae growing in the coral reef because you just take a picture of it and it's green, right? They didn't do a plot to say that there was, you know, X number of biomass per hectare. They said there's a just a there's a hell of a lot more macroalgae there, folks. So I just put that in, right? So the data you can use in these is quite good uh, or quite. Awesome. Because yeah, it can be qualitative, right? And uh, and you know how to run bays nets, so you could you could hedge your bets and say I'm I'm only eighty percent sure that birds went up, and it, they might have not changed by twenty percent. So you can you can do all of those nuances in this framework and have it as you know how good a bays net works for that sort of purpose. So so just so because I, I don't use that so you clicked on the bird fish and changed some of the observations and the gray boxes. I did, and, and then because it's like it sort of back up and said, ah, oh, well, that means that the trophic model is less likely now. In fact, the null model is just as good. Exactly. So model testing. And isn't that what we're supposed to do as scientists? Yeah. Isn't that what we're supposed to do in a risk assessment of a scientifically based approach? So that's this is one of the tools we're using to try to improve the state of risk assessments in complex systems that are data poor. 
So that's my, I'll get off the soapbox now and I'll get back to the top. How much more time I have? Because I'm at a juncture now where, depending upon the interest of the audience, I could go off and talk about alternative stable state theory or uh, chaotic systems, which you showed some interest in, or I could wrap it all up. I don't even know where I am with time. Uh, did anyone have a discussion? Or, or go home, or talk about chaos, or stable state? What do the guys online think? Are there anybody else left on there? Technically, I could sit through another couple hours of this, but uh, I'm just limited in time, so. Uh, Fair enough. Well, the thing is, is that Scott can always have me back for a four-day workshop. Um, he just has to wine and dine me again. Um, so, yeah. Everyone else online, does anyone have any preference? We can either go some discussion and we can put the microphone in the middle of us and just all chat. Or we can try, or we can let Jeff continue. What were the um, uh, options? Look, I think the points I'm going to make with these other slides are minor compared to the ones I think you guys really wanted. Um, I just heard some things that you were interested in, so I, I threw in some ideas about that, but they're not core. So I think I've given the core. I'll give the uh, the wrap up, which is four uh, slides. Yep, and then yeah, that would be good. Thank you. Uh -huh. So, um, let's just make sure I got. Um, so, general and realistic models. By the way, Levins didn't coin the phrase uh, mechanistic or statistical or numerical simulation. I put those um, handles on it just so I could more easily talk about it uh, when I give lectures, but he called them just generally general and realistic models, generalist modeling approach. Um, they complement numerical simulation and mechanistic models by revealing the implications of system structure to those systems dynamics. So is it important to include this nonlinear link between this variable and this variable? No, it doesn't seem to make an appreciable result qualitatively. So you might get away with it, leaving it out of your uh, mechanistic model if you thought that that wasn't important as well. Or maybe it was important. So it lets you consider how to structure your, your model because some of these numerical simulation models take years plural, to get the parameter space pinned down. So, and I found out that once they're more than six months into it, they do not want to entertain a change in model structure, <laughs> right? So best to figure that out before you start spending the big bucks on parameter space. Uh, statistical models, they complement them by providing causal explanation for observed correlation patterns. Reciprocally, statistical models provide hypotheses for system dynamics, relationships, and qualitative approaches, and it can help quanti quantify magnitude of uncertainty of parameters in mechanistic models. And mechanistic models reveal implications of parameter strength to qualitative models and provide predictions for magnitude of effects in statistical models. So they're all should be working together and no one approach, I believe, is superior or uh, to others. But you know, I have found that as scientists, we are more typecast by the lens, of, the methodological lens by which we view the world than anything else. We really assort ourselves into our cognitive silos based upon the methodological approach. So. Uh, I think we need to have a more, you know, pluralistic approach in terms of looking where we can, should seek complementarity from other approaches. It's important that we get, that we develop our sharp swords and arrow points for our own methods, but we need to really combine them in the collective hunt by, you know, working in, working in concert with other, other approaches too. Um, 
So when you, you look at this, this uh, idea of a trade-off, I've been talking about the poles, like a qual pure qualitative approach or purely a statistical. But of course, there are, in, you know, path analysis uh, provides a, an overlap between a qualitative and a you know, statistical approach. And there's lots of, uh, my, my use of uh, Bayesian uh, conditional probability tables in, informed by numerical simulations is a clear overlap between numerical simulation and qualitative approach and a statistical. So um, there's, there's no one pure modeling approach. Um, you should look for complements wherever you can find them. Uh, but you can, never you can never occupy the high ground here. You're always gonna be making trade-offs um, and different simplified assumptions. Um, so I'll just leave you with that. <laughs> it's a tough crowd, is it? <laughs> no, 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 no. Right. 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 Guys, are there any questions? I got, I got a brief one. Oh, oh. Hang on, there's some uh, it's God, okay. echo there. Okay. If you speak in the microphone, you should be able to. I think the microphone is right here. Can you guys hear now? Yeah, I can hear that clearly. Okay. Uh, so, Jeff, if you come over to my laptop, we can all sit. Close. Okay. Everyone can hear everyone. So here's today. Yeah, sure. So if you want to fire away, Alex, I think we can all hear you now. All right, son. Uh, first of all, yeah, thank you very much for the talk. Uh, really, really interesting. I always like seeing more, like how to approach the qualitative side of things. Um, I was just wondering, basically, in terms of when you're trying to deal with the sign, and obviously, like the problem of how how big is the effect of a particular sign when you've got like eight positives and two negatives um is it possible um that those two negatives would outweigh the positives um if you're going through the process of basically like expert elicitation to build the nets and exclude or include particular nodes in the first place have you thought about including um, considerations on the actual like magnitude of those effects in those nodes from the experts rather yeah. than simply considering the sign. Yeah, but when you do that, you don't know the, um, the convoluted arguments that you're entering into because of the, the contingency. When you invert the matrix of the, that's representing the, uh, the interaction matrix, community matrix, you'll get a proliferation of, of terms that they show up in these, you think it's just one link in one place, but it shows up in all the arguments everywhere in every prediction in a parameter space that's highly um, contextual or contingent. So it, you think that you're just making a very simple assertion about one link, but in, it's being traded off against every other link. So you might have a lot of knowledge about one link and you'd like to specify that. But, you know, a system of 10 variables has tens and tens of links and you're not going to do it. You're not going to be as certain about all of them. If you were, then you'd be going off already making a numerical simulation model. But we just simply don't have that kind of information about most systems that are ecological or sociological or economic. So yes, you could, you could say, I think that this link is strong, but you could just hold back with that assertion, wait for it. You could do something called a sensitivity analysis of the qualitative result. So this is where I use symbolic algebra and I'll take the symbolic argument for uh, increase or decrease in something. And I'll say that, well, what is the um, partial derivative of that link with respect to the symbolic argument for the prediction? And I'll find out if it comes out more in positive or negative sides. Often, if it's just randomly allocated 
or, or if it's just away from the main play of the input response variable, it sometimes shows up equally in both. And so knowing a lot about that variable doesn't give you any information. It's only if it gives you information about something you care about. So if you have, if you're really concerned about how is this thing gonna go up or down with respect to this management lever I pulled, then you do a sensitivity analysis about the most critical links that determine whether or not that thing will go up and down. And then that's where you put your management research question. So I use qualitative modeling to identify what are the critical uh, links that we would like to know to determine this very important question. Not, not taking that and doing that at the end, but not at the beginning of the modeling building exercise, because I think it can become a red herring. Mm. You don't know the implications of the graph structure, unless it's a very simple model. Once you get above five variables, you simply don't know the implications of making an assertion about a strong or weak link yet. But what I do all the time is people say, that is a weak link. And it may not be important. I say, very good. And I just take my, this is why I like whiteboards. And I just do, I make it a dashed line on the whiteboard. And then I'll make a model A and a model B with and without that link. And then I'll carry it forward. And that's, that is in itself a sensitivity analysis of the link, of the effect of that link in the model structure. So there's, don't, everyone wants to rush to precision. Say, well, it's, I like, I like your approach. Let's just try to make it more quantitative. Right, that's, that's Marcos. Everybody wants to do that. And I've learned that that's just human nature because, well, I don't know how you were taught, but in general, Western science is biased towards thinking that rigor is precision, but it's not the same thing. Can I ask a quick question if Alex is done? Yeah, 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 I'm done. Um, all right. So, uh, well, thank you very much for the for the talk. Really interesting. Something that I haven't really even heard about, to be completely honest with you. But uh, very interesting. Um, I am wondering because I'm coming from a purely quantitative modeling background. I'm wondering if you're familiar with any traditionally quantitative this maybe not disciplines but fields that um, adopt a qualitative. Um, <laughs> thinking to their modeling or or have you have you seen any you know kind of like happy ending stories where a, a traditionally quantitative background decides to do a qualitative model and then then they discover something that you know is unexpected in one way or another oh has are you asking whether qualitative modeling has been informative to a research program so for example um i'm an engineer for example, uh, something very hardcore engineering in terms of in terms of uh, an application uh, decides to apply qualitative modeling, and then there are uh, unexpectedly positive outcomes of, of this choice. Are, are you familiar with uh, uh, any 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 such research being done? I mean, I, I suppose ecology is is more amenable to qualitative models, but um, but you know, um, well. Richard Levins originally developed qualitative modeling from signal flow graphs out of electrical engineering. So it's, it's embedded in there. I found also that while he didn't quote it in his developments, it was uh, used first by Paul Samuelson in Foundations of Economics in 1954. It showed up in economics first there. Um, about the same time as uh, engineers were using the reasoning in signal flow graphs. Um, and then the economists developed it along a, a line that I find very odd because they started proving very obtuse theorems for small numbers of variables, but never applied it to, I think, its full potential in economic theory. But maybe it's because economics is not really a science and they don't care about that. <laughs> Well, I'm really upset about that. I think that they should have right there at that juncture where they're developing these fundamental tools to make testable hypotheses. They don't, they, they just play with these small little provable theorems that are unuseful to the real life. And they don't use it for its true work, which is real life. And, yeah. um, Jeff, yes, yesterday when we were speaking- well, I don't think I answered his question though. Um, no, I, I, my question was, was rather vague to be completely honest. I, I mean, I- uh, I, because I like what 
what I saw in this talk, uh, and and particularly the Navier Stokes treatment that you that you showed in the beginning, which kind of opens up the the notion that regardless of how well applied numerically a, a, a given model or a frame modeling framework is, it's also amenable to to qualitative reasoning. And you know, I, I'm I'm thinking, okay, you're going to design this uh, supersonic transport, right? Can you do a first pass in qualitative modeling based on, you know, based on what people think, based on evidence before, as you said, uh, before uh, throwing the big buck in developing this massive CFD or FEM model to, to do precision calculations. So yeah, that, that's, that's, um, that's what I was, uh, I was no, wondering. I think, I, think it, um, I don't think I've seen examples of it other than what I played with, um, or there's some, a few choice examples in the literature where it was uh, applied to open channel flow to resolve right. some theoretical impasses. But uh, it's, it's, I think it's ripe for the undertaking to be applied because no matter how well you pose a problem in engineering, you're on purpose leaving a lot of things out that are important, like social right. impacts that you, you need to leave out because your first, your first objective was just to say, is this thing going to work? You know, and then then you want to know how it interacts with the society later, maybe. Um, so you could do it as a parallel research program to be sure. Um, awesome, yeah. So yesterday, Pete, we spoke about the application of this stuff to design problems in engineering. And Jeff said that it's most useful, these types of problems are most useful when there's significant feedback loops. So I don't know if you want to embellish that any further. Oh, yeah. But yeah, I don't really add, this technique doesn't add information if it's just a lot of independent factors affecting a variable. Then mm -hmm. that's the job of statistics, let's say. Um, and, but as soon as you get some variable interacting with another variable and another variable, and that goes back to the beginning, then most analytical frameworks can struggle with that unless they're very, very well specified. And in data poor situations, especially. Right. Yeah, I, I mean to be realistic about about the whole situation, it's only uh, up to an assumption that you have an independent set of variables that affect something. It's always or almost always um, the the situation that you have some sort of interdependence or feedbacks or you know other complex interactions as you that as you correctly pointed out, you just choose to idealize out. Uh, in the interest of, you know, uh, tractability or computation expense or, in, uh, I don't know, interpretability of the model or something. Yeah. But uh, yeah, okay. okay. May I ask another question before I need to go? Um, sure. Just a, a more a more um, precise one, I hope. So the, in the dependence um, in the dependency column that you showed for the, for those quantile regression plots, how did you define dependence? Was it Similarly qualitative, like? Well, it was simply that if there is a predator-prey link, so with any one pairwise interaction in the, in the models that we were using as to train our data set, um, it, it was a plus minus relationship. We just made sure that the minus was stronger than the plus by some mm -hmm. degree, all right? So that's as a couplet. Okay. That, that is a form of dependence, and I'm not mad crazy about probability theory and everything, but well, when we first did that work, Keith Haynes, Jeff Hosack, and I, I thought that the different distributions of parameter space were going to, and you need to know that I did my PhD on just that first row, first column. I just did a flat distribution without dependence. And I got some results, found out that 0.5 prediction weight gave you a good 90, you know, rule of thumb, high, I just called it a high level of sign determinacy. And if it didn't meet 0.5, I said, well, maybe you shouldn't trust it so well. And I thought that when we started doing these other parameter spaces, you know, skewed left, skewed right, normal, um, that it was going to destroy my results. I was a little nervous, you know, didn't know, because I'm, I'm not really that clever with probability theory. And my co-author, Keith Hayes, is much, much better thinker statistic. So is Jeff Hosack. They said, no, 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 it's not going to be the distribution. It's going to be 
the dependence. And I said, ah, dependence, ah, so what, you know? Turned out he was right. Keith was absolutely right. As you could see, the clouds of points look nearly identical in the first column, but the first column and the second column, it explodes. And the dependence really matters in terms of having an outcome on simulations, numerical simulations. And I think it's another elephant in the room. Yeah, very much so. Yeah, th this is something that we've been exploring, um, well, in depth, or maybe not so much in depth, but quite intensively, I would say, in, in the Risk Institute under Scott. I mean, yeah. at least for me, he opened my eyes to the um, importance of dependence and and uh, we've run a number of analyses that suggest that marginal distributions are not so, not nearly so important in many situations, not almost not everywhere, but in many situations, not nearly so important as is dependence. Mm -hmm. So, okay, that's, I just wanted to, I just wanted to know about this. Thank you very much. Thank no. you. I uh, unfortunately need to go, but uh, enjoy that discussion uh, and uh, hope to speak to you in person at some point in the future. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Uh, one o'clock, I think. Um, and Jeff has to turn into a pumpkin at two. Yeah, the, have you checked out of your hotel? Yeah. So uh, maybe it's uh, a good time to adjourn. Um, thanks again. Yeah, my, my train's at 207. 207, yes. So that's funny. But yeah, you can. I can, you can we can, if anybody has any more questions, I could take another one or two. It's plenty of time. Jeff, he's not giving up. So I've got quite a simple one, I think. Um, so all of the examples that I saw today were like first order partial differential equations turned into um, these components. I guess it's not really possible to do a second order interaction, right? Second order partial differential. I'd have to look at the equation and just see what you mean by So that. certainly you can populate it in the same kind of Jacobian matrix that I think, if you without give... introducing another node, right? You'd need to introduce another node to be able to do it. You'd, ha you'd have to show me what you mean by that, what form of equation you're thinking about. Okay. If you can well, give me a Jacobian. Order, you don't just mean second derivatives, right? No, 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 I mean second order. <laughs> um, but yeah, so I guess like you couldn't have two, You could. so all of the examples we saw was with two edges between, a maximum of two edges between any nodes, right? Yeah. You couldn't have a third edge between those nodes and things like that. No, I wouldn't know what to do with it. In this framework, yeah. Well, if you have a third edge, is you have to work, combine the two edges, right? Yeah. Are or these edges work. additive in the equation? I mean, um, then they're added anyway. They're they're always one edge, and it's just whether one's greater. Or yeah, perhaps. And that happens all the time. Sure. Um, that that's a nonlinearity, and we we deal with that by saying, are you, are you on the left to the right of the threshold of the, of the inflection that creates a positive and negative? And then we just have two different, we have a split of models. Sure. And that's my eutrophic, mesotrophic state model is because of that effect. Yes. So how sensitive is the model? to this distribution of the weights, right? Because it seems that you're making some assumption about the relative magnitudes when you do that, right? I like to do that all like in 2006 and I don't like to think about it anymore. What I basically did <laughs> was said, okay, I need to describe how well my prediction weights work. For models that could be built into an infinity of time and maybe get used on other planets someday. So I need to have some general way to just say, what's a parameter as a first order approximation of how this linearized system will behave? What's, what's a decent training, a set of training uh, equations or, or uh, models to, to generate a, some you know, first cut probability of how, and it turns out that look, there's nothing fancy going on under the hood all it's doing is figuring out the value of the inverse matrix. Now the inverse matrix is the adjoint matrix divided by the determinant. The determinant is a single number. So it has no information in terms of relative differences of what's going on in the adjoint. So I throw that out, get rid of it. The adjoint itself is nothing but a combination of arguments of alpha ij times alpha ij in a train that's equal this times this times this 
that n number of multi n minus one number of multiplications plus another train of alphas. So there's nothing going on there except multiplication and addition or subtraction. Mm -hmm. So there's nothing fancy. So really, you just got these algebraic arguments that you just want to find out. If I don't know anything about the values of the alphas, how often is this thing going to be positive or negative? Well, I think it's pretty fair that there's nothing special about that. So that's why I don't really care about what parameter space you use. But even if your inputs are, even if your model is linearized, depending on how steep those gradients are, will affect how the direction of your output then? I don't know what gradient you mean. Well, you mean like the magnitude of, of the influence, how positive one thing is compared to how negative the other thing is, that number will affect the sign of the output. No, I don't have to get the slope right. If this, if the partial derivative of this variable with respect to that variable has a negative slope, I don't care. I don't care how great or less that slope, I don't have to be negative. And then I say at that point, I have a veil of ignorance over me. I only harvest out the qualitative. And given that, if that's all I know, I ask, this is the, this was in my abstract, I guess I should say, if all we know are the signs of the Jacobian matrix, what do we know? We don't know everything, but we know at least this much. Now, if you want to know more than that, go forward and numerically simulate, go forward and specify equations, go forward and specify. That's the, really equality, right? In terms of us, but the uncertainty is high, because it means that you can relax, you yeah. know, you can, you can, you know, compute the with the uh, boxes or whatever, it's, it's with, set, with sets, so you, could, you could have like this, the set of real no uh, positive numbers, set of negative numbers, plug them in and see what, and see what, what happens. Yeah. If, if, you don't, if, you, if you don't inflate too much in terms of uh, computing, uh, if you do a good job in that sense, then you can actually say rigorously uh, whether uh, the outcome is positive or negative. That's, that's interesting. It's so clearly an analogous argument to a lot of the things that we think and discuss, uh, so yeah. clearly. So the, the, the qualitative approach is really good news for us. If that, if that works, uh, as, as you say, uh, that's, that's really good. And it's always part of the story, right? It's never, it, it, it's like the UQ stuff that we do. It's not like that answers every question under the sun, including does God exist. Hmm. It's just it's part of the story of an appropriate way to to solve problems that are really really hard. Yeah. Um. And and for systems that are really a lot more complex than we the engineers normally than any of us work with. Yeah. Well, projects, you know, that's one thing. You maybe know what the physics are and everything. But for bigger things like networks of systems, hmm. when there are inputs coming from ecological and sociological and economic so impacts. Yeah, 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 yeah. You don't want to just be the economist uh, slash ecologist yeah. slash sociologist, you, um, but you can maybe handle the science. I, I, I have a yes. question about getting. I before. expect that complexity would uh, uh, make you not take a decision. It wouldn't make we leave it. Sorry, no, no, no. Absolutely. Okay, wait, wait. We, we need to stop, stop the recording. Oh, please do. Uh, I, Francis recorded. I know, but he asked us to stop the recording. I don't okay. know how. Because you're a co host. Oh, I just unplugged. That's oh, fine. That stop it? <laughs> no, 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 that's fine. Um, so, so I've got a question. Uh, I think you closed it. Any of them, Jim? Yeah, we stopped it. We stopped it. It's fine. Um, so my question is about kind of the structure to these elicitation exercises. Is there any structure? Or is it kind of what you've learned over decades of doing it? And so the structure, so when you engage in these elicitation exercises with a panel of experts or yep. a room full of people or a conference hall or whatever, yep. are there, is there like a clear strategy? So you, you spoke a little bit about it. So like defining Look, the scope I'll tell you what, the key beginning. Mostly what happens is that the people that have invited me to do it are horrified by the first half day. Right because <laughs> it is a free for all. Right. And I don't stifle any, I do control the alphas, right. using the alpha males, I have to tell cool. them to shut up and let other because it's very, you know, that is egalitarian. Um, but the, um, the process is, is there's no one right way to enter a house and go in through the front door, the back door, the window, or to the attic, you know, just, you're gonna get, you're gonna go eventually through every room in the house. And you can't control. Do you know? Uh, but, but basically, basically, you have to constrain by you define 
the relevant subsystem based upon the problem. Sure. Still recording. Yeah. Right. So, do you know um, Tony O'Hagan? No. He has this Sheffield elicitation framework, and it's all about the parameter space. It's all about defining distributions to things. And he yeah. he's kind of he's published a bunch of things now about this kind of structured process. And he's given us talks a couple yes. of times. About I think I've it. seen papers that are trying to do similar things. And I mean, I guess I guess the question is, is that something? when you're gone or no longer doing this kind of thing, or if Ander wanted to go into a room full of people and start building one of these one of these models, and it's something important, so we don't really know where to start. Are there, is there like a clear path, at least the phases of I, I it? I keep or, meaning to, to find a way handbook. to teach that. Yeah. I haven't, it's not something I've taught. Okay. And it's recognized as a gap, because like, yeah, hit by bus scenario. And I've, I've spent my whole career caring about this so i think i've gotten better at it sure but anybody could but they the, the ingredient is you have to want to sure and you just can't blow in and blow out for a week and just think you're going to read some paper and say oh now i'm going to do a elicitation and get these because you, you have to be listening to people's stories sure. and you have to be i don't know unintelligent but perceptive enough to, to hear that there's a process in there right. important and it's, a, and, and it's that, dialectical. That's yeah. about your skill, right? But yeah. so there are some components of the shelf approach, like before they all meet for the first time, he'll aggregate all of the information. So any reference that people want, he'll either synthesize it down. If it, if you get 100 references, he'll ask for it to be synthesized down. And so everyone begins with like this same document, yeah. uh, the same set of documents. And, and this is kind of like your prior reading. And then we get in the room and there's sort of five stages. He's a very, it sounds like a very organized person. I wish I was that organized. <laughs> yeah. It's one of my failings. But I'm also, because if, because I leave it free form, but I know what I'm looking for. I And they're always going to rebel. The right. audience rebels. And then you bring them around slowly. And after a while, you entrain them. And then they're all on the journey together. And then sure. you start building models. Right. But I've never been able to cut out that process sure. of rebellion and... Uh, and then say, oh, I can see how I fit into this. Right. People always reject it first. Sure. Because they have to concede their worldview to a greater whole. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah, you should write something about how you do it. <laughs> Even if it is just yeah. subtle kind I shut of. Because I'm getting ready to go. And I have to, right. Know, is it still recording? It's still recording. We sort of can't turn it off. Can you adjourn for the other people who are still here? Um, I think we're going to adjourn, guys. It's just, just quickly one lesson. Like, is I know it, um, you were saying just before about trying to elicit like the magnitudes of the effects and how it, it's not about trying to like shovel quantitative approaches onto what is supposed to be a qualitative approach, but um, is there not something interesting that could perhaps be done if you have like a consensus that the effect of something is small, but that would be inconsistent when it's propagated through this network that you've all arrived on as the appropriate model or like it through a set of models that you want to be using? Is there not something that interesting that could come out of propagating those through and seeing that like perhaps these conflict with people's opinions of what is and is not? Oh, sure. Look, you just by building the model itself, I always underestimate the importance to the people in the room. But after I spent a day working with them, because I've seen hundreds of these models now, so not that thing, nothing surprises me, but I just anticipate that it's going to, there's going to be some model there. But to the audience members, they go, oh my God, that's, I never realized that that's, you know, the way it worked. I had people saying that, um, this is the first, I feel like I've stepped out of my office for the first time and crawled up to the top of the building and seen the city for the first time. This is in Santiago where the Alps just climb up, you know, right next to the city. Um, and I always, I underestimate how impactful it is for people to contribute their small part to a greater whole. And that's a descriptive, that's purely descriptive, right? And I'm, I'm off running to get to the predictions. But and what you're saying is actually an, uh, an important aspect of that uh, is saying, well, where does this one week, what are the implications of this one week link potentially that you might care about? That's a, that in itself is sort of a descriptive thing. But, and there is, and I didn't present it today, but if you are interested in the effect of one link, then you can do a sensitivity analysis about that link. 
and say what is its impact to a set of predictions that you might pose or care about. Um, so yes, there's a lot you can do with this method to investigate what if this link is strong or what if it's weak? What would it, how would it affect the stability? How would it affect the shift to the equilibria? Um, that is it. Oh, that is that. Yeah. I, th yeah. I, th I think I was thinking more like um, how, like, give, given a model or a set of models that you've settled on, um, does that like conflict with some intuitions people might have about those inputs, and like how how would they reflect on uh, that conflict? Like, would that give them pause with the model they've chosen, or would that cause them to challenge? Just as, as a way of, I don't know, because it, it, as a purely qualitative approach, just as a way of prompting more uh, what's going into these models. Um, just look, like, is this, is the output model consistent with what you might think about the inputs, just as a way of kind of prompting more reflection? I don't yeah, know if that's of any use. Yeah, but... We do that all the time. We say, yeah, yeah, yeah. You, know, you have this model, you think the world works like this, you think the world likes books like that. But, and, and there's all these other models, but only these models are consistent with observation. And they hinge on these links as being the definitive difference in the dynamic. So yeah, you could do that. I, I understand what you're saying. You could do that. Yeah. And I'm sorry, I have to go now because my train- Oh yeah, sorry. <laughs> thanks, thanks very thanks much. Very much. So thank you everybody. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye.